Welcome to the seventh chapter of Flamingo, Going Places by A.R. Barton. Now this chapter is definitely going to interest you a lot. Why? You shall know further. Before that, let's know about the author. A.R. Barton is a modern writer who lives in Zurich and writes in English. In the story Going Places, Barton explores the theme of adolescent fantasizing and hero worship. These two words should give you the clue why the chapter is going to in interest you. Adolescent fantasizing and hero worship. Here we go. The story revolves around a teenage girl Sophie, her family and friends. She is a daydreamer who is always lost in her dreams of becoming rich and sophisticated though in reality she is a worker at biscuit factory who says you can't dream big you definitely can just like sophie she was working in the biscuit factory but she had real high dreams the story suddenly twists up when sophie makes a wild imagination of meeting danny casey a famous footballer now you see she has started weaving her dreams here we begin the series. She also makes a story in front of her brother that Casey will come to meet her on a fixed day as per a promise he made to her. Well, that was a real good dream. Let's see how far she gets to it. So, to introduce the characters to you, Sophie, an optimistic teenage girl, works at a biscuit factory, dreams of a beautiful life and has a wild imagination. She can dream really wild. Talking of Gen Z, Sophie's friend, a realist. Now she was a very practical girl. She wouldn't dream very unrealistic dreams, but she was a really practical girl. Jeff, Sophie's elder brother, trainee mechanic. Now here, he is her elder brother and he is learning to be a mechanic. He is under training. Derek, Sophie's younger brother. Danny Casey, a famous footballer admired by Sophie. Well, let's begin the story. When I leave, Sophie said, coming home from school, I'm going to have a boutique. Well, now she begins, this is the conversation she and her friend are having. And so she begins with that when I am done with school, when I shall be through with school, I am definitely going to run a boutique. I am going to own a boutique. Gen Z, linking arms with her along the street, they were walking together, looked doubtful. She looked at her with all doubts. She said, how is it possible? It takes money, Soph, something like that. This is a huge expenditure. It requires a lot of investment. How will you get so much money? I'll find it, Sophie said, staring far down the street. She says, not to worry. I'll figure it out. I will definitely find that money and I will definitely own a boutique. Take you a long time to save that much. Now, just as we know, Gen Z is a very realist person. She says to get that much money, it's going to take you very, very long to save that much and then start your boutique. Well, I'll be a manager then. Yes, of course, to begin with. She says, never mind, if I can't directly get to there, I shall start with baby steps. I will go step by step. I will first be a manager. Till I've got enough, but anyway, I know just how it's all going to look. She says, I'll begin with being a manager and then I'll gradually keep moving higher and higher. And again, her friend reminds her, they wouldn't make you manager straight off, Soph. You think directly they're going to appoint you as a manager? Is it possible? I'll be like Mary Quaint, Sophie said. Who's Mary Quaint? She is a very well-known fashion designer. So she says, I'll be one like her. I'll be a natural. They'll see it from the start. She says, right from the start, when I start designing clothes, they will, they're going to love it. I'll have the most amazing shop this city has ever seen. She says, I am going to make it so beautiful, so interesting, that it is going to be one amongst the best in the entire city. Gen Z, knowing they were both earmarked for the biscuit factory, became melancholy. 
Now she says they were both reserved. They were both there for the biscuit factory. They were currently working there. So she becomes a little sad. She says, how is it possible for her working in a biscuit factory? She's going to earn that much that she will land up becoming a boutique owner. How is that even possible? So this thought actually makes her a little sad. She wished Sophie wouldn't say these things. She was just hoping that her friend should realize that it's not even possible. She shouldn't even dream that high. When they reached Sophie's street, Gen Z said, it's only a few months away now. Sophie, you really should be sensible. She says, very soon we are going to complete schooling. It's just a few months to go. At least grow up, start thinking wisely. Do come out of these unrealistic dreams. They don't pay well for shop work. You know that. Your dad would never allow it. He says, neither will you get good payments over there. You will not get a good salary. Also, your dad is not going to allow you to work there. Or an actress. Now, there's real money in that. And still she's weaving her dreams. Still she's going on dreaming bigger and bigger. She says, okay, if not that, then maybe an actress. I'll probably be one and there's real big money. Lot of money in that. Yes, and I could maybe have the boutique on the side. Well, well, now she weaves, she puts both her dreams together. She feels that, yes, I can become an actress. And beside that, I can definitely run, you know, a boutique. So she wants side income as well. She's talking of, you know, running the boutique. She says, you know, actresses don't work full time, do they? Right? It's not all the time that you are into shooting. I, always, I will get free time when I will do that work. Anyway, that or a fashion designer, you know, something a bit sophisticated. Now she says, I will not do anything ordinary. Nothing that everybody does. No rat race for me. No layman thought for me. I am going to do something really sophisticated, something really big quality, something very worldly. And she turned in through the open street door, leaving Gen Z standing in the rain. While they were walking, while they were heading home from school, she lands up near her house, right? Sophie comes there and she just takes a turn towards her door, leaving her friend alone in the rain. If ever I come into money, I'll buy a boutique. Now, while she was going towards her house, she says, no matter what, as and when I get that much money, I will definitely open a boutique. Huh, if you ever come into money, if you ever come into money, you'll buy us a blessed, decent house to live in. Thank you very much. And she was told, she says, okay, first and foremost, as soon as you get that much of money, yes, if at all you get it, for God's sake, First, buy us a nice, decent house to live in, a nice, comfortable house to live in. Sophie's father was scooping shepherd's pie into his mouth. Now, as she enters her house, her dad was eating food, right? He was scooping shepherd's pie. What do you mean by scooping? Scooping as in, we are all aware, it, we talk of scoops of ice creams, right? So we scoop it through. Here, he is scooping his shepherd's pie. He was eating. As hard as he could go, his plump face, still grimy and sweat marked from the day. Now, while he was eating, his face was dirty. It was full of sweat. Why? Because, yes, he had just returned from work. So, obviously, he definitely was, you know, totally in a bad condition, not yet fresh enough. But he was eating his food. She thinks money grows on trees, doesn't she, dad? Said little Derek, hanging on the back of his father's chair. We are aware Derek was Sophie's younger brother. And he tells his dad, he says, don't you think this girl thinks that money grows on trees? We are going to pluck it and we are going to use it. Is that the case? This is what she thinks. He tells his dad while he was standing behind his chair. Their mother sighed. Now here she gave a nice heavy breath out because she was tired. Sophie watched her back, stooped over the sink and wondered at the incongruity of the delicate bow which fastened her apron strings. Now her mom had a bent back. Her back was a little crooked, 
right so stooped here you can see shoulder which is bent forward she was stooped over the sink she was probably cleaning the dirt there and wondered at the incongruity incongruity is inappropriate it was not suitably at the place it should be so the delicate bow that fastened the, the her apron that she was wearing it was not at a suitable place the delicate seeming bow and the crooked back now her back was crooked she had some issues in her back so her back was stooped and again that bow so definitely it was not in the right place the evening had already blacked in the windows and the small room was steamy from the stove and cluttered with a heavy breathing man in his vest at the table and the dirty washing piled up in the corner now this is the description of that ambience right there at that point of time what was it the evening had already blacked the windows can you just see they have put it in such beautiful words they could have said it was night time in simple words but you see what the words they have used the evening had already blacked in the windows meaning it was night time and the st the small room was steamy from the stove now it was just one room now this description tells you that everything was happening in one place right so while the mother was cooking the room was all steamy and it was cluttered with heavy breathing man in his vest here of course a uh, heavily cluttered was he was totally untidy he you know when he had come back from work his face was also yet dirty right at the table and the dirty washing piled up in the corner at the same corner over there there was litter there was plates to be washed there were dirty plates so all that required cleaning now that was the situation she looked around she was looking around she felt a tightening in her throat she went to look for her brother jeff now when she looked at all these things around her they were so dirty they were so messy everything in that one thing everything together clogged up there and she really felt bad about it she says she was suffocated she didn't want things to be like that she was looking for something bigger so what she does she just avoids that she just forgets it and she runs to look for her brother jeff her elder brother jeff he was kneeling on the floor in the next room tinkering with a part of his motorcycle over some newspaper spread on the carpet now what was he doing when she went to talk to him he was kneeling on the floor we all know we kneel down on our knees and he was tinkering with a part of his motorcycle he was repairing remember he was a trainee mechanic he wanted to be a mechanic so he was taking training so right now he was repairing some part of his motorcycle which was spread over the newspaper which was on the floor now he was 3 years out of school 3 years back he had completed schooling an apprentice mechanic apprentice he was learning he was taking training traveling to his work each day to the far side of the city now where he was going to take training where he was working he was learning it was pretty far from the city so he would travel a lot to and fro now this is the background given for her elder brother jeff He was almost grown up now obviously he's finished schooling 3 years back so definitely pretty grown up and she suspected areas of his life about which she knew nothing about which he never spoke now obviously he has grown up his friend circle will be different he will have different meeting coming across different people so she suspected she said you know i'm sure he there's lot happening in his life and she was very you know curious to know what is happening in his life and she knew nothing so obviously she wasn't aware of it because he was very quiet about the fact he wouldn't really share it with her he said little at all ever voluntarily on his own voluntarily on his own he never shared anything with her he spoke very little words had to be prized out of him like stones out of the ground now to to get words out of him was as difficult as getting stones out of the ground to get something some information from him was very difficult and she was jealous 
of his silence. She couldn't take the silence. She says, no, he has to share it with me. He should speak with me. I am really interested to know what he is doing, what's going on in his life. Now that he has grown up, I'm sure there must be great stories. He travels so far. He must be meeting so many people. There must be so much happening in his life. I want to know. When he wasn't speaking, it was as though he was away somewhere out there in the world in those places she had never been. Now obviously when he was quiet, when he was thinking, he was in his own world, in the world where he had stepped out and she wanted to know everything that was happening in that world. She wanted to know because she knew that he goes places. He goes to so many places, so obviously he must be aware of so many things and she was definitely wanting to know all of it. Whether they were only the outlying districts of the city, outlying as in the distant places somewhere far in the city where he would go for training or places beyond in the surrounding country, who knew? He was traveling, he could go to so many different places. So who knows where he's going because she wasn't allowed to go there. They attained a special fascination simply because they were unknown to her and remained out of her reach. Now fascination was captivation. There was something really special that was captivating her. Her thoughts that no, there is something and I want to know. So she was really, because it was unknown to her, so she was very attracted to that, that I definitely want to know. But the problem was, it was out of her reach. Out of her reach, why? She wasn't allowed to go out with him because they, you know, thought that she's really still small. So they, her dad wouldn't allow her. Perhaps, maybe there were also people, exotic, interesting people of whom he never spoke. It was possible, though he was quiet and didn't make new friends easily. Now, he was not the one who made friends very easily. He was an introvert. What do you mean by introvert? Introverts are those people who cannot mingle, who cannot mix with new people very fast. And extroverts, the opposite of introverts, are those who make friends even when they go from the ground floor to the fifth floor by the lift. Within that time also they make friends, right? When they meet strangers in the lift. Meaning these are how it is. He was an introvert. He did not make new friends easily. So she says, there were also people exotic. Exotic means obviously who were not belonging to that country. They were non-natives. They were not the natives of the people of the city. Interesting people of whom he never spoke. There were so many people he never spoke about them. Of course, like he said, he was very quiet and definitely an introvert. He never made new friends very fast. She longed to know them. She was waiting. She was longing to know them. She wished she could. She wished she could be admitted more deeply into her brother's affections and that someday he might take her with him. Now she was very curious. She was really longing that, oh God, I wish I could know what is happening in his life. She wanted to get involved deeply into his life into his affections, what all is he doing, whom all is he talking to, what's going on in his life. And maybe someday, sometime, he might take her with him. Though their father forbade it and Jeff had never expressed an opinion, she knew he thought her too young. Like I said, they already were thinking, the father, Jeff, her elder brother, that she is yet a little girl. She is not a fully grown up one. So she needs to stay away. He did not forbid means he did not permit. He had banned it. He had prohibited. It was not allowed. He was, she was not allowed to accompany Jeff. And even Jeff felt that, yes, uh, she is a little young and I don't think she needs to step out now. And she was impatient. She was getting impatient. She wanted to know so much that she couldn't keep any more patience. She was conscious of a vast world out there waiting for her. And she knew instinctively that she would feel as at home there as in the city which had always been her home. 
it expectantly awaited her arrival. Now, she was conscious of a vast world. She was aware. She was very much aware that there is a big world out there. There's something really big, something really interesting out there waiting for her. And she knew instinctively, instinctively without conscious thought. That means she was very well aware of the fact that she would feel as at home there as in the city. Now she said in that world also I'm sure that I will definitely be very very comfortable just like I am here right now. It expectantly awaited her arrival. She was like expecting it. She says you know what they are all waiting for my arrival. I need to go there. She saw herself riding there behind Jeff. Now another dream to start. What was she visualizing? What was she imagining? She was imagining that she was riding there behind Jeff. She was sitting with Jeff. He wore new shining black leathers and she a yellow dress with a kind of cape, with a kind of scarf or a stole that you can call that flew out behind. She felt that, okay, he was nicely dressed in a black, uh, probably black jacket. And she was in a yellow dress with her scarf flying. She's on the bike with her brother. There was the sound of applause as the world rose to greet them. Applause as in they were all ready to welcome her with loud cheers and loud claps as both of them enter there. That is how she was imagining herself. He sat frowning at the oily component. He cradled in his hands as though it were a small dumb animal and he was willing it to speak. Now she was lost in her own world. She was a daydreamer. She started dreaming. She was lost there while her brother Jeff, he was frowning at the oily component. He was annoyed. He was that the oily, that part that he was talking about, the machine he was, talk, he was handling. He cradled in his hands. He was holding in his hands as though it were a small dumb animal the way he was you know sort of carefully looking at it that as though now that thing is going to speak to him i met denny casey so sophie said now while they were doing this while he was busy with his machine part and she suddenly tells him that you know what i met danny casey sophie said he looked around abruptly where and he was busy with that part and suddenly she tells him, I met Danny Casey, Danny Casey, the famous footballer. Yes. And suddenly he looks at her. He says, where? Where did you see him? In the arcade, funnily enough, in the gallery, you know, where there are all the whole line of shops out there. So I saw him there. The brother says, it's never true. I did. She says, he asked her, you told dad, did you mention this to dad? He asked her. And she reverts, she shook her head, chastened at his unawareness that he was always the first to share her secrets. Now she was playing very smart. What she did was she very, you know, with a very humble thing, she shook her head saying, no, I have not shared it to dad. And what was she trying to tell her brother that, you know what, you are the first one to know my secrets. I don't share it with anybody else. It's just you. You are the first one. And can you tell me why was she doing that to her brother? Because she wanted to know things from his end, what are going on in his life. And that is the reason she was very much, uh, you know, very, in a very smart manner, she did that. I don't believe it. Her brother says, look, I just don't believe this. There I was looking at the clothes in Royce's window when someone came and stood beside me. And I looked around and who should it be but Danny Casey. He said, I was looking around in Royce's window. I was looking at the different clothes and suddenly I felt someone is, you know, beside me. And the moment I look up and I realize it's Danny Casey. All right, what does he look like? Now, her brother is not ready to take that story from her. He says, as always, she must have dreamt about it. So he is just not ready to believe her. And he says, okay, fine. If that is the case, what does he look like? Please tell me. Oh, come on. You know what he looks like. He says, come on. This is not someone you, you know, he's so famous. We know him so very well. What do you want me to tell you? 
close to i mean okay he says fine so you were so close to him that must be a different thing so tell me what how does he look when he's so close well he has green eyes gentle eyes and he's not so tall as you'd think he says you know what his eyes are nice and green obviously she was so close to him she could see his, into his eyes he has gentle eyes he has green eyes and he's not very tall you know he's not just as tall as you would think she wondered if she should say about his teeth but decided against it she says you know uh, she thought that should i mention about his teeth but then she realized she says no 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 i don't think i should do that i should stop here only their father had washed when he came in and his face and arms were shiny and pink and he smelled of soap now while the conversation was going on between Jeff and Sophie their father enters the room he enters after a nice good bath because that's how he says his face and arms were shiny and he smelled of soap so he had a nice shower he switched on the television tossed one of little Derek's shoes from his chair onto the sofa and sat down with a grunt now he switched on the television he came in he had finished his food he had taken his bath he was all fresh so now he wanted to watch television so he went and sat on the tele he sat on the sofa but before doing that he picked up Derek's shoe was lying there he took it he threw it aside and he went and sat down with a grunt with a low rough noise uh, generally the case when you're tired you know when you're back from work and you just sit down to relax that's how it goes Sophie met Danny Casey Jeff said now Jeff is telling his dad he says you know what Sophie met Danny Casey Sophie wriggled where she was sitting at the table now she was sitting at the table by then so she wriggled a bit she you know just turned she twisted a bit like to tell her dad her father turned his head on his thick neck to look at her he turned across he was like a plump face he had obviously a thick neck he looked around to look at her his expression was one of disdain what do you mean by disdain totally disrespectful he says there goes because they were all aware that she is a daydreamer so obviously this must be one of them and he just looks at her with total disrespect it's true jeff said now jeff had believed her so that's why now he's convincing his father that look it's true she has actually met him i once knew a man who had known tom finney his father said reverently to the television but that was a long time ago now he didn't want to believe that story he says okay even i know somebody who had known tom finney tom finney also was another famous celebrity he says with total respect he takes that name and that was a long time ago and jeff tells him okay now this is something you have already told us well the conversation still continues and this we shall watch in part 2 and here we come to the second part of the story going places you remember we concluded part one when Jeff is convincing he's telling his father that Sophie met Danny Casey but he's not ready to believe he said even I knew someone who knew Tom Finney Tom Finney was another English footballer with great respect he takes that name that person was really great and so the story goes on so when Sophie's dad tells that he knew somebody who knew Tom Finney she says Casey might be that good someday better than that even he's the best now she's totally in favor she's literally totally in love with Dan Danny Casey and she says I'm sure someday even he will be as good as Tom Finney and he is the best that's what he means to her if he keeps his head on his shoulders if they look after him properly a lot of distractions for a youngster in the game these days he'll be all right he's with the best team in the country so when sophie tells her dad you know that he's the best no matter what someday i'm sure even he will be like tom finney her dad tells her 
you know something if he keeps his head on his shoulders that means he's very alert if he really does it very wisely if he plays very smartly if they look after him properly if the if he gets a good coach he will be trained very well a lot of distractions for a youngster in the game these days these days apart from playing these you know these players are distracted with many other things if that all does not happen to him surely he will be the best because he is with the best team in the country he will obviously go very very far he is very young yet he is older than i am he say, she tells him that he is still so young in fact he is older than i am too young really for the first team you can't argue with that sort of ability her father tells her he is too young really he is actually very young for the first team to get into that team he is really young and you definitely cannot argue you know with that sort of ability with the ability that he possesses yet he is not yet up to the mark he is not that very great a player he it's too good that he is there in the first team but he doesn't deserve to be there because he is very young he is going to buy a shop Sophie said from the table and suddenly while this conversation was going on with her dad she tells him that he is going to buy a shop her father grimaced he grimaced he was angry he was shocked where did you hear that said, how come you know this because he remember her father never let her out really so he was angry he said how do you know that and she says he told me so he muttered something inaudible and dragged himself round in his chair this another of your wild stories he asks her he says is this another wild story of yours is this another story that you have cooked up says how is it possible he just said something you know inaudible means nobody could hear he muttered something to himself and he just sat down in the chair he just said oh must be one of her one of another old you know those stupid wild stories she met him in the arcade jeff said and told him how it had been now jeff is still continuing to you know convince to tell his dad that look she has actually met him and he told her when she met him in the arcade one of these days you are going to talk to yourself into a load of trouble her father said aggressively he says look let me tell you something the way you are going on the way you talk that what you dream that what you cook up stories some day you will fall into big trouble this will get you nowhere but in trouble you better take care the father advises sophie jeff knows it's true don't you jeff she tells she says jeff see he even he is believing me it's true ask him he don't believe you though he'd like to he says look even he does not believe you even if he wants to believe you he will not he doesn't believe you that's what her father tells her the table lamp cast an amber glow across her brother's bedroom wall and across the large poster of united's first team squad and the row of colored photographs beneath three of them of the young irish prodigy kc now they are describing actually the whole family was in love with the football they they actually their main sport their the sport that they all loved was football so they were all into it so this is how it shows you that they actually you know the entire family was into the footballing thing so his room was lit up it was amber glow there was rice rice uh, red light all around and across the large poster of united's first team now on his wall there was a nice big poster united was the name of the team okay that was the first team squad and the row of colored photographs beneath below that there was a nice colored photograph of three of them who were the young irish prodigy kc prodigy is a young person with exceptional qualities 
he definitely had that great quality to play very well so yes he the uh, casey's picture was just beneath that promise you'll tell no one sophie said nothing to tell is there says so she tells him look you will not tell she wants she's sharing another secret uh, you know with uh, jeff and he she tells him look i'm telling you something don't tell it to anybody and he says what is there to tell promise jeff dad murder me he says you better promise me first otherwise dad will kill me if he comes to know about this only if he thought it was true the brother says he will kill you only if he thinks what you are telling is true otherwise there is no reason for him to get angry please jeff she is requesting him she says, please don't do this just listen to me i have something really really important to tell you christ sophie oh god sophie here christ means oh god sophie you are still at school casey must have strings of girls says you are so young you are still schooling that guy is a footballer i'm sure he knows so many girls groups of girls he must be knowing n number of them you are nowhere into the picture and she tells him no he doesn't have girls how could you know that he jeered he says how do you know that he's you know trying to tease her you know you tease someone how do you know that he doesn't have girls he told me that's how she's telling him that you know what he told me he doesn't have girls as if anyone would tell a girl something like that he says why would he tell you that he has no girls yes he did he isn't like that he's quiet say so he's not that type of a boy he's a very quiet boy not as quiet as all that apparently he's saying well it doesn't even show seemingly you think that is the case it's not the case it was nothing like that jeff it was me spoke first she says he is not like this he's definitely not you know why i can give you one more proof the thing was i started speaking first he was so quiet that he did not even approach he did not even talk to me it was me who spoke first when i saw who it was i said excuse me but aren't you danny casey she says that i when when i stood saw him beside me and i was like shocked and i immediately asked him excuse me but aren't you danny casey and he looked sort of surprised he was a little shocked and he said yes that's right and i knew it must be him because he had the accent you know like when they interviewed him on the television she was definitely sure about the case that it was danny casey because he had that accent now he's from ireland he's an irish boy so obviously they have a different accent altogether so she had watched his interview on the television and she knew the accent so i asked him for an autograph for little derek but neither of us had any paper or a pen she says i immediately wanted his autograph for derek derek her younger brother so i thought of getting his autograph because he would be happy but the problem was both of us neither of us had pen or paper we did not have it so then we just talked a bit so we started just talking a bit about the clothes in royce's window she said now that at that point of time i have since we were right in front of royce's window i started talking about clothes he seemed lonely now she felt that you know uh, because the way he spoke out of the way you know when someone speaks to you you can make out so he seemed lonely after all it's a long way from the west of ireland she says he was far away from his place so maybe he was lonely and then just as he was going he said if i would care to meet him next week he would give me an autograph then now just because just at the time he was about to leave she's telling uh, you know jeff that he told me that if you meet me next week i would probably give you an autograph then because at that point of time both of did both of them did not have paper and pen of course i said i would she says of course i definitely would want to you know uh, get your autograph so i would uh, lovingly meet you and as it is she was totally crazy about him so why would she refuse 
as if he'd ever show up. Now, her brother saying, oh, you think he's going to come? He's going to meet you? You do believe me now, don't you? She said, you already believed me, right? You were telling dad that I am true and now you're not believing me again? He dragged his jacket, which was shiny and shapeless, from the back of the chair and pushed his arms into it. He dragged his jacket, that means he pulled his jacket. He pulled it out of the chair and he put it on. She wished he paid more attention to his appearance. Now, her brother was elder. He was three years, uh, you know, after schooling. He was done. So, he was big enough. And she felt that he's so nice, tall and handsome. Why doesn't he wear better clothes? Why doesn't he look at his personality? He should pay more attention to his appearance. Come on, he's so young. He should look much more smarter. Wished he cared more about clothes. Wish he could wear better clothes. He was tall with a strong dark face. He had a very smart personality. And she felt that I wish, you know, he could wear better clothes. Handsome, she thought. Yes, he was definitely handsome. It's the unlikeliest thing I ever heard, he said. He says, this is totally something unexpected. Now, you are telling me that he's going to come and meet you. It's definitely not even possible. It is totally doubtful. On Saturday, they made their weekly pilgrimage to watch United. Like I already told you, they were all football lovers, the entire family. So, on Saturday, they made their weekly pilgrimage. Now, actually, pilgrimage means a holy place, you know, a place where you go and worship God. But right now, here it is showing the devotion to the match, their love, their dedication towards the game. So, yes, it was a weekly pilgrimage. That means every week they would pay a visit. They would go to watch United. United, the name of the football team. Sophie and her father and little Derek went down near the goal. Now, all three of them, they went pretty close down where they could see the goal. They could, you know, see, watch that. But Jeff, as always, went with his mates, with his friends higher up. They went and sat on top. He went with his friends. Now, he was a young guy. Obviously, he had his own company. So, he went and sat, sat separately right on top with his friends. United won. 2-0. The United team won with two points and Casey drove in the second goal. A blend of innocence and Irish genius going round the two big defenders on the edge of the penalty area with her father screaming for him to pass and beating the hesitant goalkeeper from a dozen yards. Now, this is one scene they are describing where the second goal was to be done and it was done, going to be done by Casey and her father is screaming right sitting from there. So, he says, why don't you pass it? He felt like, you know, he was sitting so far and he feel like be beating him up from there. Go pass it to the goalkeeper. Sophie glowed with pride. Afterwards, Jeff was ecstatic. Yes. Now, she was very proud that, oh, yes, Casey did it. Her father kept telling, no, that he is not that good. But look, he made the goal. And of course, Jeff was extremely happy. He was totally excited. He was very, very happy. He was ecstatic. I wish he was an English man, someone said on the bus. Ireland will win the World Cup, little Derek told his mother when Sophie brought him home. Said so definitely they will win. The island will definitely win the World Cup. Her father was gone to the pub to celebrate. He went for a drink. He went to celebrate the victory. What's this you've been telling? Gen Z said next week. About what? Your Jeff told our Frank you met Danny Casey. Well, well, the secret has leaked. You remember, she told her brother, don't you tell this to anybody. But what has happened? Jeff has told Frank and Frank must have told, you know, uh, Gen Z. And she's, what are you going about telling anyone that you have met Danny Casey? This wasn't an inquisition, just Gen Z being nosy. 
she said this was definitely not quite she was not questioning her she was not questioning sophie about it she was just being a little nosy she was a little curious that when did this happen how come i don't know but sophie was startled sophie was in for a sudden shock she was like oh my god how does she know about it oh that gen z frowned sensing she was covering yes that she looked at her she says yes i am talking about that you please tell me well yes i did you never did gen z exclaimed she says when was this it was it didn't even happen what are you even telling me she was literally angry with her friend sophie glared at the ground she, her eyes were you know stuck to the ground she lo she was looking so angrily over there damn that jeff this was a jeff thing not a gen z thing now she says that this what i story which i made up was only for jeff it was not for gen z because why why was she saying that because she knew gen z definitely will not believe this she was a very realistic person a very practical person obviously she would never believe her it was meant to be something special just between them she said this was only supposed to be between jeff and me how does she know something secret it wasn't a gen z kind of thing at all she said it is not for this girl she will never ever want such a thing to happen tell goki gen z something like that and the whole neighborhood would get to know it what do you mean by goki graceless yeah, this girl has no thing about her she has there's no charm she doesn't even think on those grounds so what if, if she comes to know the entire neighborhood would come to know she would just leak it out everywhere damn that jeff was nothing sacred he said couldn't he just keep it up to himself why did he have to tell her it's a secret meant to be i'll keep a secret so you know that she says actually now she's telling her friend gen z she says actually this was supposed to be a secret between jeff and me so gen z tells her are don't worry i will also keep it a secret only i am not going to share it with anybody i wasn't going to tell anyone there'll be a right old row if my dad gets to hear about it here now there'll be a big big noise if my dad gets to know about this he is going to be extremely angry gen z blinked a row i'd have thought he'd be shoved as anything he would be more than happy why would he get angry i mean come on you're meeting danny casey and you all are football lovers why would he get upset about the fact she realized then that gen z didn't know about the date bit now she was a little relaxed she was a little you know cool she somehow cooled down a bit because she realized that all that gen z knows is about what they met at the royce's window she doesn't know about the date with him so she knows only that first thing jeff hadn't told about that he had not mentioned about the date she breathed more easily she was relieved she says hush thank god she doesn't know about the date so jeff hadn't let her down after all he says at least something he kept secret he did not cheat on me he believed in her after all so he actually believed jeff believed in sophie after all some things might be sacred come on at least something something might be really there between us it was just a little thing really she says now she goes to explain to her she says nothing it was just a little thing i asked him for an autograph but we hadn't any paper or a pen so it was no good she says actually the thing was i had asked him i wanted his autograph for derek but the problem was both of us did not have neither pen nor paper how much had jeff said now again a question mark so how much did he tell her how much does she know actually jesus i wish i'd have been there her friend gets excited she's saying oh god i wish i was there with you even i would have met him of course my dad didn't want to believe it you know what a misery he is 
she says you know what as always why would my dad ever believe me he is such a misery he's totally you know away he's totally a discomfort but the last thing i need is queues of people round our house asking him what's all this about danny casey now if anyone if anything comes up to him and there are long you know set of people standing outside a house and they come and ask him what about danny casey he'd murder me he'll literally kill me he'll be so angry and you know how my mom gets when there's a row when there's a row of people when there's a long queue of people you know how upset my mother gets gen z said hushed very softly very quietly you can trust me soph you know that she says you know what come on soph you know me so very well i am not going to let it out i am going to keep it a total secret after dark she walked by the canal along a sheltered path lighted only by the glare of the lamps from the wharf across the water and the unceasing drone of the city was muffled and distant now remember she was heading towards that place where she went she wanted to meet danny casey she was about to meet now they are describing that spot so she walked by the canal she walked by the waterway there was a waterway out there along a sheltered path lighted only by the glare of the lamps it was that whole place was lit up by the lamps from the wharf across the water from the wharf that's the dock you know you have the place where the ships dock so she had gone to that area and the unceasing drone of the city that total you know not stoppable noise that you know continuous noise of the city was muffled it was totally messed up and it was distant that whole noisy thing set up was away it was far away and this place where it was it was a nice calm quiet and a serene place it was a place she had often played in when she was a child she used to come and play there when she was young enough when she was really uh, like a child she would go and play there there was a wooden bench beneath a solitary elm where lovers sometimes came she sat down to wait now she was in the hope that yes danny casey is going to come and see her so where was she she there was a wooden bench out there right beneath a solitary elm solitary there was one single long tree which was over there and there was a bench just beneath that where lovers sometimes came now obviously lovers look for a quiet place so she went there she sat down to wait she started waiting it was the perfect place she had always thought so for a meeting of this kind she was meeting him for the first time she was meeting someone whom she loved she admired and so to meet such a person she wanted a place which should be very quiet away from the noise of the city in a very serene place for those who wished not to be observed she knew he would approve obviously she did not want anyone to spot them she did not want anyone to see them so she preferred that place so that nobody you know could notice both of them and even he would have surely loved such a place for some while waiting she imagined his coming now does her imagination ever stop no again while she was waiting she started imagining she watched along the canal seeing him come out of the shadows imagining her own consequent excitement now she watched along the canal she felt you know okay from that waterway just you know he's coming from there out of the shadows she was imagining her own consequent excitement she you know she started feeling oh god now if he's coming from there how excited would i be she started imagining all of that the daydreamer not until some time had elapsed did she begin balancing against the idea of his not coming now she did that she waited for some time and it elapsed some time went by some time passed she was waiting and waiting and suddenly that thought that fear started creeping into her started coming into her that is he not going to come 
Here I sit, she said to herself, wishing Danny would come. Wishing he would come and sensing the time passing. She kept thinking that, oh, I wish he turns up. I wish he comes to see me. And she kept wishing as the time went on. I feel the pangs of doubt stirring inside me. She could feel that pain in her stomach. She could feel that terrible pain of the fact thinking that, what if he doesn't come? I watch for him, but still there is no sign of him. There is no even clue that he is going to come. I remember Jeff saying he would never come. And how none of them believed me when I told them. Jeff had already told her, oh, you think he's going to come? He had already not believed that at all. And that's what she felt. None of them even believed that what she had told them. I wonder what will I do? What can I tell them now if he doesn't come? She says, now I have nicely boasted. I have very, you know, smartly said that, oh, he's going to come and I'm going to meet him. But now, now that he's not going to come and see me, what am I going to go and tell them? But we know how it was. Danny and me, that's the main thing. How can you help what people choose to believe? She says, who cares? I don't care. It's okay whether they believe or they don't. I know it's all about Danny and me. But all the same, it makes me despondent, this knowing I'll never be able to show them they are wrong to doubt me. Now, this totally at the same time, obviously, she was disheartened. Her heart broke. She was despondent. Her heart broke. This knowing I'll never be able to show them they are wrong to doubt me. She's saying now, if he would have come and seen her, obviously, she would nicely go and tell them loud and clear. See, I told you I met and I actually met. But now that he did not come to see her, how on earth would she make them believe that yes, he had come? Now they are never ever going to believe this girl. She waited, measuring in this way the changes taking place in her. She waited and waited and you know, gradually those things started coming in her mind that now what's going to happen next? Resignation was no sudden thing. She did not want to just leave from there. Here resignation means she did not want to depart. She didn't want to leave that place just suddenly. That was not the solution she felt. Now I have become sad, she thought. And it is a hard burden to carry this sadness. Now she was totally sad. Her heart was broken. She started giving up hopes that I wonder if he would come. Too much of sadness, she couldn't take it. Sitting here, waiting and knowing he will not come, I can see the future and how I will have to live with this burden. What burden? The fact that he was going to meet her and he didn't turn up. He did not come. So, you know, she kept thinking that, you know, probably okay like somehow she started accepting the fact that he wouldn't come and she could see the future she says now i know i will have to live you know with that sorrow in my heart that he never came to meet me they of course will doubt me obviously as they always doubted me but i will have to hold up my head remembering how it was she says they will keep undoubted they will totally keep doubting me but me I will hold my head up. I will say it with proud that yes, it was, uh, you know, how uh, remembering all this would make me feel good. Already I envisaged the slow walk home and Jeff's disappointed face when I tell him he didn't come, that Danny. Now she started visualizing, you know, she started thinking of it that, okay, now when I go home, this is what is going to happen. This is the scene that's going to happen. Jeff will be disappointed, right? And when I tell him that, okay, you know what? He did not turn up. He actually did not turn up. And then he'll fly out and slam the door. Obviously, even he would get angry and he would just move away from the house and he would bang the door very loudly. 
but we know how it was i shall tell myself danny and me now she is stuck over there only she is consoling herself she is you know pitying herself she is telling herself don't worry ultimately it's all about danny and me so other things don't matter it is a hard thing this sadness the sadness you know the heartbreaking sadness which she faced she climbed the crumbling ste steps to the street the crumbling the broken you know they were broken they were as you sometimes the steps are so weak when you walk on them you know they crick crick they crack you know so they are the crumbling steps outside the pub she passed her father's bicycle propped against the wall now as she was walking home back from that place she saw her father's bicycle near the pub she was it was just outside it was that cycle was resting against the wall and she was happy why was she happy he would not be there when she got home she says thank god at least when i get home i won't have to face him he will not be there to tell me other things excuse me now again just watch this again now she is passing by you know that arcade and again she is visualizing the whole thing excuse me but aren't you danny casey coming through the arcade she pictured him again outside royces while she was passing royces shop again that we, that shop again there and she again gets that whole picture into her mind how it had all happened he turns reddening slightly reddening blushing you know when someone suddenly tells you oh you're danny casey like like you're very famous you know and anyone comes up to you so obviously you know you feel a little i mean yes that's right he says of course i am danny casey i watch you every week with my dad and my brothers you remember they they used to go every saturday we think you're great she's you know recalling she's remembering again that same old episode oh well now that's very nice i mean he's happy he's saying okay great you're like me you know performing very well i wonder would you mind signing an autograph now you know that scene where she had asked him for an autograph his eyes are on the same level as your own now she is talking to him eye in eye his nose is freckled freckled you know he has those light spots uh, those irish people they have it you know some uh, brown spots on the skin so his nose had that and turns upwards slightly and when he smiles he does so shyly exposing teeth with gaps between he was smiling it was he was very shy he was very you know he blushed when she spoke to him so and when he smiled of course uh, there were gaps between his teeth you remember right in the beginning when she was talking to jeff about him he has green eyes and then she says should i mention about the teeth this is what she didn't want to mention that he has gap between his teeth his eyes are green and when he looks straight at you they seem to shimmer they seem to shine they seem gentle almost afraid very afraid you know very small eyes like a gazelle's a gazelle is an animal sort of thing where an asian african antelope something like a deer you know resembling a deer and you look away you know you just want to look into that and you can see those eyes shining they're a little afraid a little shy you let his eyes run over you a little you wouldn't mind he looking at you top to bottom and then you come back to find them slightly breathless so when when you come back to it you know when he starts again looking into it by the time you're like breathless and he says i don't seem to have a pen at all you realize you haven't either he says look neither do i have a pen right now and it seems that even you don't have it my brothers will be very sorry you say he says of course my brothers will be sorry otherwise they would have been very happy you know looking at your autograph and afterwards you wait there alone in the arcad for a long while standing where he stood remembering the soft melodious voice the shimmer of the green eyes and she waited there she stops there even after he left she stood there remembering oh my god i met him i met that man who has a, a real melodious voice a really musical voice and that shine of the green eyes she waits there 
no taller than you he's not very very tall generally footballers are but yeah he didn't seem that tall no bolder than you he was not that he was a very shy person an introvert like i already explained before the prodigy the prodigy the young man with superb qualities wonderful qualities the innocent genius he was innocent but at the same time he was a genius the great danny casey now this is how she describes him that never ending love for him that admiration she was totally mad after him and she saw it all again last saturday so every time she's passing from there that scene becomes live in her mind saw him ghost past the lumbering defenders the lumbering defenders as in he was moving in a very awkward manner right he was moving in that manner heard the 50000 catch their breath as he hovered momentarily over the ball now here she is describing the scene the football scene you know that whole playground scene so he was moving in a very awkward manner you had those defenders you know they were trying to defend they heard the 50000 catch their breath who are the 50000 the audience right they were like oh he's going to make a goal and this is how she describes it as he hovered momentarily he flew he literally flew briefly over the ball and then the explosion of sound as he struck it crisply into the goal and then that sound comes where he gives a nice goal the sudden thunderous eruption of exultant approbation what do you mean here the sudden thunderous that's the strong like thunder voice eruption that's the explosion of exultant overjoyed people overjoyed audience so this is the scene that you know they are describing the author is describing when he goes to make the goal and when he goes to make the goal what is the reaction of the audience sitting there so all that she does was she was imagining the whole thing that daydreamer the girl with the imagination running totally wild she comes and she stops here and we stop here too but i want to close my eyes and drift off into a world where we are perfect now what do you get out of this what are you trying to what is the take away of the lesson so he says i want to close my eyes and drift off in a world into that world where we are perfect is it possible is it possible are you perfect or am i perfect well nobody is but i guess that's why they call it a dream a dream remains a dream it's not something that actually you know gets converted into reality quite a few times we dream so many things happening to us but do they all come true they don't because we'll never be perfect it all remains a dream well there's no harm dreaming students there's definitely no harm but remember something with dreams make your efforts don't let dreams let you sleep right it's the morning when you wake up those dreams need to come true with your efforts so yes keep dreaming big keep watching and keep learning